Well, happy September or July, whichever you wish to describe this kind of weather. Uh, looks like we have some hundred degrees uh, following us into otherwise known as Indian summer, huh? Uh, and Look like a bunch of potheads. How's that? The coffee's gone. Ah, fooled ya. So, so if anybody wants to get another pot going, uh, if we have anybody coming, I think others might be coming. So anyway, any announcements? Yes, Carl. I'll be starting on men's breakfast again, and we'll have it here next Saturday at 7:30. This coming Saturday? Yeah. Are you going to be there? Yeah. As always. <laughs> I'll have a member too. Oh. I have an announcement too. She just oh. said she'd help you remember. Oh, oh okay. <laughs>
that you can listen to uh, Christian. It's like Christian radio is a podcast, and it's RefNet, it's Reformation Network. And it's through Living Air, which is R.C. Sproul's ministry. And I listen to it, and it's really great. They have short little clips, of, like this one today, they have a your mind, R.C. Sproul. They have New Testament Gospel. They read from the Westminster Confession. They have um, Who for Life with Alistair Begg, who is a uh, Baptist. He's reformed, very, very reformed Baptist. They have uh, Charles Spurgeon, ultimately with R.C. Sproul, Proverb of the Day. They have cr good Christian music, really good hymns um, with just great stuff. And then from the pulpit and John Gerstner, all kinds of good stuff. So you can download that. You can just go to Reformation Network and you can get that. It's free. Great. Yeah. Any other announcements? Okay. Uh, women's Bible study will start a week from Monday. We're going to be talking about what did Jesus do, which is the study of the work of Christ. I don't know if Sproul formed that off of what would Jesus do kind of obsession of our culture Jesus to. Did. I know, that's what I'm saying. He, I think, maybe is playing off of that, taking the focus off of ourselves. Yeah. Now we have a blind man. Anybody want to help him sit down? Or? <laughs> I hope no one got offended. Someone lost a federal position by making a joke on some handicap. I apologize to all who are blind. But based on last week, that means that's all of us, so... Okay, enough of this spontaneous association, free association here. And so, that and Carol. No? no? I, was, I was wondering if Carol was going to announce women's life. I see, okay. Uh, the conference is coming up. Uh, I met with the uh, new pastor's uh, new point person. Uh, the Minister of Outreach and Evangelism from Lifeway, and Todd Say came up from Sovereign Grace and Moral, and we're on target for the conference. Um, I'm awaiting a name of contact, um, and there might... Yeah, so that's coming. We did get our advertisements that you can hand out, but there was a major misprint, so... The new ones, uh, they're reprinting them at no charge, and uh, they're coming Wednesday. So I guess Sunday I'll have them all here. I have some big posters that uh, were printed. They're accurate, and if you want some window posters to hang in uh, businesses, um, I can get you those today, but I did leave them at the office. So uh, let me know. We need to get them in windows. I put them uh, into the new Civic Center, hoping that the new mayor will not be offended. Uh, and I think we're in good uh, hands there. So that's uh, posted at the police department and in the uh, mayor's office and stuff. So let's get them out. Uh, let's make this a successful thing. I think we have probably 15 people coming from Denver, including my little, uh, not so little kids anymore. Uh, some of them are coming and then others are coming as well. So let's continue to be in prayer on Wednesday. Uh, please, ladies, uh, pray for God to use this. Our, our goal or our, our mission is to bring substance of historic Christian faith to Goshen County and beyond. It's not particularly a reformed focus, though all of our speakers have been reformed, but it, it's, a, it's a bridge to build and to get rid of this anti-doctrinal thinking that exists in the church and has hurt us terribly. So, it's Hebrews, 
take the, the texts are printed on the back of your bulletins. I suggest that you read and ponder. Take some of your own commentaries or Google the search uh, and get familiar with this text because the less you know, the less you will be fed. The more you know or are aware of the text, the more you will be fed. So, so be purposeful, be, be diligent, and apply yourself to what's coming. And this is the first time we get a wife, which is uh, wonderful. I've never met her. I've met Doug on, uh, he came to my seminary when I was in school. So um, he, he's, uh, he apologized for the uh, plane ticket, uh, and I didn't open it. I sent it to Nancy. Uh, I assume it's because it's on the expensive side. He, he said I'm six foot seven, and I have some blood clot issues in my, uh, somewhere in his body, and so he can't be in cramped spaces. And I said, well, there goes my hope that I found my long lost brother uh, that I never <laughs> knew. And uh, so anyway, we're all excited. This is great. We've got so many things coming down. We have worship at the ranch, October 9th, I believe, is the Sunday, that may be jointly held with uh, the country church in Fort Laramie. You can pray about that. They're pondering it. And uh, so that might be something in the works. Okay, I think that's all for the announcements then. Ah, yes, thank you. Uh, there's Tuesday night open barrel starting uh, this Tuesday night, 7 o'clock, and also, as Susan mentioned, the Wednesday Bible study here. And the person is Doug Moo. I remember that name from somewhere. But uh, he's going through Romans. I think we start with chapter 8 or 9. I can't remember. So, yeah, that's at 5.15 on Wednesday. Thank you, Susan. I am starting the Sunday after the conference. So, not yet. Yeah. The first Sunday uh, in October, right? No. What did you say? The Sunday after the conference. Which is October 2nd. So, October 2nd. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Forgot my hearing aids. So sorry. Okay. Well... I have to move that or I lose it. It's a weird thing, so every so often. Let's stand as we're able and sing Hosanna, loud Hosanna, number 125 in your songbook.
praise you, O God. We have, uh, uh, together. Yes, sir. Uh, the Te Deum. We praise you, O God. We acknowledge you to be the Lord. All creation worships you, the Father everlasting. To you, all angels cry aloud, the heavens and the powers are stirring. To you, cherubim and seraphim, continually you cry, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabbath, heaven and earth are full of the majesty of your glory. Please be seated and join with me as we open up with prayer. Most gracious and loving Father, you are also our king, the king of all peoples, the king of the earth, indeed the king of the cosmos, and everything has been created and brought into existence by your mere word. And that word we found out from John the Apostle is the second person of this triunity, the Son. You used him and the Spirit. It was an all-encompassing act of God in your fullness, and you brought something into being that was not. And in doing so, everything exists in a covenantal relationship with you. Everything. Because everything was brought into existence by you. And here we are, Lord, in another rhythm of the Lord's Day, worship. And we come seeking to render our heartfelt praise in response to what you have done for us and what you did on the cross. So let that be our heart's focus, Lord, because that alone can trump our sorrows. That alone can make our joy acceptable. And so we ask, be here as you've promised. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. And now as we come into his presence, we do so acknowledging that we are sinners. And so I pray that the Spirit will allow us to engage in this confession with our whole heart. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ is risen and the Spirit has been given. My blood is mine. Let us therefore confess our sins as we worship our risen Lord. Heavenly Father, your Son's work of redemption is finished. While our flesh with its desires has been crucified with Christ, making us truly justified, we are yet encumbered with the residue of sin. We desire, yet we push back. We hope, yet there is grief and sadness. We possess, yet not fully. It is this waiting, this not yet, that in part causes our hearts to be heavy. In ways that we cannot fully understand, we sin because we are yet sinners. Forgive us, O Lord, and give us that we may be delighted to your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. And now, one and all who are here, hear his declaration of grace. We have confessed together we are not what we should be. We are sinners. His law justly weighs in, making our conscience feel its transgression. Nevertheless, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ reign supreme for the joy of gathering his people, and in our place, Christ has both fulfilled the law and has borne the fury of a just and holy wrath. Our guilt is gone. He has also bound the strong man, freeing us from his bondage. Therefore, with joyous shouts of hallelujah, 
I declare to you God's work through Christ alone, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Glory be to the Father. The Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like Therefore the wicked will not stand in the day of judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And now I direct you to the screen in which there's a little explanation of Psalm 1 within the Hebrew tradition. It contrasts the blessed man or the righteous with the ungodly. The musical setting that you will hear uh, seeks to contrast these themes in the music by means of melodic and harmonic means. The music may sound Middle Eastern to you, and you would be right. Uh, the scale used is commonly found in the Middle East. Uh, it's often referred to as the Spanish scale or the Hebrew scale. Now this causes you to raise an eyebrow as to why are we singing it. Don't forget that the blessed man, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, was a Middle Eastern Jew. So Psalm 1.
And now we'll have the reading of God's holy word. Today's first reading comes from Jeremiah, chapter 18, 1 through 11. Hear the word of the Lord, the potter and the clay. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was doing work. He was, and there he was working at his wheel. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to do. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom, that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. And if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it, and if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I had intended to do to it. Now, therefore, say to the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am shaping disaster against you and devising a plan against you. Return everyone from his evil way and amend your ways and your deeds. But they say, That is in vain. We will follow our own plans. And will everyone act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart? The word of the Lord. The second reading is from Philemon chapter 1, verses 1 through 21. Hear the word of the Lord. Paul, a prisoner for Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Apphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Philemon's love and faith. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though, I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required. Yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Jesus Christ. I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with you, write this with my own hand. I will repay it, to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. 
Refresh my heart in Christ. Confidence of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. Word of the Lord. The Gospel reading comes to us from Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 25 through 33. Hear the word of the Lord. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yea, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down and first deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let's stand and sing God of our prophets number 168 in your songbook.
Amen. Please be seated. That tune comes from the Genevan Psalter of 1551. What a marvelous, what a marvelous uh, tune. And we'll open up with a short word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will be with our speaking and in our hearing and in our hearts meditation. We ask in your name, amen. This is a famous text from Jeremiah. It's a contested and hotly debated text within Christendom because some, like our tradition, point to the emphasis here that God is free to do that which pleases him regarding the human race which he has created. And this is through the metaphor of the potter and the clay. And Hugh read that to us, and the, the surfaced similarities to what we see are, are, are in, in the text. Jeremiah is told to go down to the potter's house to observe what a potter does working with the wheel. And he works something, it doesn't shape the way he wants it, he tosses it, he puts on another, and this seems good to the potter to do so. Now we emphasize what seems good to the potter. Now others within Christendom emphasize that God's actually responding to the pots and the clay, and some clay's good to mold for a desired end of the potter, and some clay is not. And whether it's good or whether it's not is really our response to God's calling. And obviously, the church has been wrestling with this kind of doctrine since its creation. And Augustine made it famous when he attacked the Pelagius strand uh, that was arising in the church that said, uh, basically, like the red fern grows, God helps those who help themselves. And Augustine said this is antithetical to the grace of God that's found in Scripture, and this being a passage that's similar to that point. Um, so, however we choose to come at that issue, or however people come at that issue through this text, one thing is clear, and that is God's pleasure in the end product. God's pleasure in the end product. And in this case, it was the nation Israel. Israel was plucked from the human race and was called. They were the son of God. They were the elect of God. That's who Israel was in terms of how Scripture portrays this potter God and the clay, the nation of Israel. And I can just wet your tongue just a little bit in case you forget some of these texts. Um, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, 
Uh, well, let's go to Exodus chapter 19, actually. Uh, Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 through 7. Let me read this to you. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people. Now, there's a little chiastic structure here that I wish to point out for emphasis. And... Uh, it's not printed in your bulletin, so you'll either have to tune to it or tune to me. Um, but there is the opening statement that if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession. Now, if we underline treasured possession there at the end of verse 5, then... If we go down to verse 6, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So this treasured possession is uh, parallel in a chiastic structure to the kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So God's treasured possession, and by the way, treasured possession is a phrase that indicates royalty, and royalty's good pleasure onto something. And the king owns it, and it's his, because he cherishes, he delights in it. So, so we have treasured possession in verse 5, and we have a further delineation of what treasured possession means by a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So there's God's choice of Israel, now, it's true there's a condition, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be. But God's initial choice of Abraham, did you ever wonder why he chose Abraham? I mean, why didn't he choose Carl? Not this Carl, but I'm sure there's maybe a Carl that exists. I mean, why Abraham? And we really have two basic answers to that. Well, Abraham alone in all the world had this desire for God that pleased God. And so God chose Abraham. Now, the other is simply that God has been pleased to select a wandering nomad in some foreign country to be his vessel of choice. And so this is God's freedom. God is free to choose, just as we're free in this culture of ours, to choose a bride. God is free, and he chose Abraham. Not because Abraham was more righteous than all the others, but simply because it is now Abraham has become, through divine election, a treasured possession of God. This is a difficult doctrine. Calvin himself said that if we run with it and press this one strand, we jump off into a dark precipice in which the very character of God is called into question. In some places he called this a, a horrible doctrine, divine election. But that's not all Calvin said. And he said that in reference to pressing the details, in pressing all the implications, if X, then Y, according to our judgment and analysis. But divine election, according to Calvin and Luther, or the Reformers in general, and I would dare say even Augustine, is to be tucked in our hearts for comfort and tucked in our hearts because of God's unrelenting promise to carry through what he has started. So the doctrine of election, far from unwrapping and unlayering the dark secrets of God, it's meant for a doctrine of comfort 
to God's people. You're a cherished bride. And in a divine, in, in, in a human, kingly, royal sense, no one can take that from the king. It's his. Susan and I watched some sort of, I don't know what it was, it was a while back, and the France of King can have any woman he wants. And he, he summoned so-and-so, and he summoned so-and-so. The king, in those days, was an absolute monarch. Even Napoleon, when he was crowned, he, he said, or was it Louis XIV, I am France. You see, this was not a shared authority between the king and his subjects. There was a certain arrogance that came with the absolute kingship and monarchy in human history. God alone possesses this absolute authority because God alone is the creator. Everything else is created, including human kings, when that was the main form of government in this country. So there's the two, treasured possession, and what does that mean? The bottom of this chiastic structure, there's four parts to it, is a kingdom of priests. Now, in between is the, uh, you are my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. You see, now this is God telling you the basis of his authority of divine election. I select treasured possessions. I'm the absolute monarch of everything. Why? Because all the earth is mine. Implying that he's created it. And as creator... He is free as the potter to do what he wants with those whom he has created. These are the words that you shall speak to my people, Israel. Now, this message is entitled, Works, Faith, and Grace Working Together. And this is where if you press certain things, you can dive off into a dark, bottomless pit that can cause all kinds of problems. What we do know is that God said regarding Israel that I chose you not because of your beauty, not because of your righteousness, but I chose you because I am the king who is free. But let's focus on the fact that God chose and you became a treasured possession, meaning kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's to Israel. Now what does that mean in the new covenant? Well, I don't think it means that the United States has a peculiar identity nationally speaking, of a treasured possession consisting of a kingdom of priests and a holy nation or a kingdom of presidents and a holy nation. I don't think any nation has that special status anymore. This was a divine theocracy in the old covenant whereby God is using Israel as an example and a type of what God's promise to Abraham consisted of. And what did God's promise to Abraham consist of? Well, it was, yes, I'm calling you. Yes, I have divinely elected you. But it has a missional purpose to it. Through you, I will bless the entire world. I will bless all the nations. And so here we have the divine elect nation Israel, which alone is the delight of God. And if I haven't driven that home enough, then let me just read another text or maybe two here uh, concerning 
Israel's status here. In Psalm 147, verses 19 and 20, he declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and rules to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his rules. Praise the Lord. So there you have the treasured possession of a nation called Israel. And I'm suggesting to you that that typological nation, Israel, is no longer applicable in today's day and age. There's no nation that has that treasured possession status as Israel had because Israel was a a type and a shadow of what God's mission plan is, which Scripture and Paul often comes back to Abraham. But Christian theologians take it all the way back to the garden. Adam was called what? The son of God. God's treasured possession. He was placed in a garden to till and to keep and to uh, take care of. And then as time rolled on as vice regent, representing God and his holiness and his righteousness, that kingdom expansion would have occurred throughout the whole earth. But that son of God failed. And that mission was put on hold. Now, right when sin entered, God clothed Adam and Eve by shedding blood and covering them. Now that's, that's a shadowing of the sacrifice of the shedding of blood of not a mere animal, which also was instigated into the nation Israel, but of a God-man who comes and sheds his blood for God's ultimate mission. And what is God's ultimate mission? The three Ps? God's people in God's place with God's presence. And so we find that now in the Exodus passage of being a treasured possession, a kingdom of priests and a nation of holiness. Okay, that's God's mission. It was from the very beginning, before sin came into the world, and God will not be defied. God will not be mocked, but God will not be defied his good pleasure. Paul says regarding the God whom we serve in Ephesians chapter 1, that God accomplishes all things according to his good pleasure. He will not be denied. A people in his place, and with his presence. What I'm suggesting between the two covenants now is that there is no nation that has that special status. There is no ethnicity that has that special status. There is no gender that has that special status. Why? Because all of it is the Lord's and God's mission is global and always has been. Very, from the very beginning of placing one person, God's son, in the garden. And then out of his side, his dearest side, he creates woman as a complementary helpmate. And that was God's mission. It still is his mission. And he will not be denied his mission. His personal treasure of a kingdom of priests and a nation of holiness and righteousness. Now I believe that that nation will come to concrete fulfillment in heaven. And it has a partial fulfillment now in the church. Because his bride is the new nation. Paul is unmistakably clear. You now are the children of Abraham. 
You are now, Peter says, a holy nation. What's Peter talking about? Judea? Uh, I don't think so. What Peter's talking about is a spiritual house that God is constructing through concrete treasured possessions which will eventually inhabit heaven exclusively. They will be a people, a nation, belonging solely to God without sin. So that, I think, brothers and sisters, is the mission of God that is from cover to cover. And while it has some nuances to it and the church disagrees here and there on exactly what the details are, they're all in agreement that God is going to have a people and a place with his presence and he has it now. Paul will use this word building. He's building you up in Christ. He's making us a treasured possession in Christ. Now what came first? A wholehearted faithful obedience of Abraham, which was not, by the way, uncheckered and constant, nor consistent. Maybe there was consistency, but it certainly wasn't an uncheckered straight line. Abraham pimped out his wife for fear of this and that. Abraham and Sarah decided to help God with his promise. So they took another woman into the covenant of exclusive marriage and then tried to use that child to fulfill God's promise and God would have none of it because God's promise and his work are the exclusive outcome and fruit of his spirit which he does inside. Typologically, the dead womb of Sarah becomes a live womb by God. When Paul says we are dead in trespasses and sins, he's saying it's going to take a miracle. We're not talking about God's looking for certain strands of authenticity within us. Okay, when Paul says that we are by nature children of wrath and dead in trespasses and sins, he's talking about what the metaphor suggests. You're dead. Sarah's womb was dead. And God did a miraculous work and created a nation out of it. But the original promise of Adam and Eve and Abraham too is that through you I will bless the world. Through you I will bless all nations. And I would suggest to you as well that Scripture says this kind of divine election of Israel was to give way like the spacecrafts that are launched by NASA. Once it gets so far, it ejects, I don't know, the big power underneath it. And so at some point, this special nation concrete treasured vessel of God is released. Paul will talk about it this way. The law is in reference to Moses, which is in reference to the treasured nation status of Israel. Paul says that the law was given, and then he parenthetically says, which cannot annul the prior promise 430 years before. Now what's Paul getting at? Before Israel is established and before the law is given through Moses, God's mission was given clarity in the life of Abraham, albeit through shadows. And so now the Mosaic covenant cannot annul the promise that God gave Abraham to bless all nations. And so this national concrete status and exhibition of a special favored nation has now been let go, like the jets of a spacecraft. It's been let go because, as Paul says, it served its purpose as a tutor, as an instructor, as a way of explaining and highlighting the mission of God. Okay, 
So now, if we return to this text in Jeremiah, we'll be able to weave some of these concepts now into the text that, we, that Hugh read to us. Well, <clears throat> one more, I'm sorry. We're going to turn to the prophet Amos, chapter 3 and chapter 9. And I want you to listen carefully to what Amos is saying. Chapter 3 of Amos, verse 2. You only have I known of the families of the earth. Isn't that, isn't that, isn't that what every bride wants to hear? I, I love you and only you among all the billions of women on the earth, and that is what the covenant of marriage is. That's why when I marry somebody, I go, you know, you can do whatever you want to, to me and to this place or a place, but you're going to recite the marriage covenant of exclusivity, a treasured possession, till death do you part. Otherwise, I won't marry you. Okay? Mm hmm okay. You can add your own vows later. You can talk about how fluttery he or she makes you feel. But you're going to confess. You're going to covenant publicly between each other, between God, till death do you part as a treasured possession. And this is what this is. You see, this book is really a, a love story of God's divine freedom to elect his bride. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Now, what is Israel's unique status? Well, it's a nation who was given a piece of land that God had promised. Now, that's all typological. The land, I believe, that Abraham has been promised, it took on concrete form. Never, I don't think, did it ever reach its full parameters, even within God's listing of the lands. But it now points us to heaven with the true spiritual nation, the concrete existence of God's chosen bride, okay? So it's really not a piece of geography that's special. It's not the land. And we know that from Amos chapter 9, verse 7. Now let me read that to you. Amos chapter 9, verse 7. Are you not like the Cushites to me, O people of Israel, declares to the Lord? You see, he's comparing, right? Did I not bring up Israel from the land of Egypt? Ah, God, ah, Israel's special favored nation status. No other nation has that. Not so. At least according to God's prophet. Let me read that to you again. Did I not bring up Israel from the land of Egypt? And the Philistines from Kaphtor? And the Syrians from Kerr? What's God doing? He's saying that the act of bringing one nation from a place to another place is not unique. That's not the unique possession that God has bequeathed to Israel. Now, he did that. He gave them a piece of land, they crossed the Red Sea, they crossed Jordan eventually, and God placed them there, and he drove out all of the other nations, because it's only that nation that God cherished and is his treasured possession, and it's all a typological portrayal of heaven. Heaven's going to be those who believe and trust in Jesus the Christ, who are in the Son. That's our treasured possession status and place, and God God's presence, it's all right there. So it's not really a piece of geography because I brought you out from Egypt, I brought the Philistines from Kaftor, I brought the Syrians from Kerr, and God could go on. 
God is the sovereign one who does with nations what pleases him. End of story, bar none, no exceptions. He will bless them, he will curse them. All nations, no exceptions. Now it gets colorful and nuanced. God will take unrighteous nations and punish his own elect nation Israel. So it's not always a strict reward of righteousness and judgment because God takes sinful people and sinful nations to do his bidding. But that further highlights that all nations and therefore all leaders are in the palm of God. And that's where our trust and security comes from. Come what may, I serve the one Lord, sovereign, creator of all that is. And I fear nothing. Yeah, what's going on? with that? I think, you know, there's going to be a loss of food supply. There's going to be, you know, and, uh, and, and yeah, maybe. Let's take our best ability and grapple with it and be obedient in terms of our civil callings, in terms of our uh, individual callings, and, and, and let's, let's march forward with the preceptual will of God. You know, we're, we're supposed to be a nation that takes care of people, and people are supposed to be self-sufficient in taking care of themselves, and, and we're here to try to figure this all out as we move forward, and we're going to do that because that's our calling. But underneath our calling is God's hidden will. It's God's decretive will, and it's coming to pass, and he does with us as it pleases him. And when he takes unrighteous nations to do his judgmental bidding on a special favored nation, that doesn't mean that unrighteousness is pleasing to God. It doesn't mean that evil and good are all relative and it makes no difference. It simply means that God is over the evil intents and thoughts and the behavior and actions of other nations and all individuals. There's nothing that exceeds his authority, that nothing that exceeds his control, but that he can't step in and do his own purposes to fulfill the great mission. And indeed, that's what he has done. And so it's not the piece of land, because God does that with every nation. So what is it? Well, we just go back to chapter 3 of Amos. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Now, unless we have a very deficient view of God, yeah, God just thinks there's just Israel down there. I mean, he's like clueless. And all these other people are running around, and he just, he just thinks there's us. That's not what... <laughs> his meaning here. The knowing, the Hebrew word for know here is the same word that is used when Abraham goes into Sarah and they uh, have a, a time and they make babies, okay? This is the kind of knowing that is used here. Paul will use it in uh, Romans e e uh, chapter 11, verse 2. Let me, let me read that marital lovemaking metaphor as well. Um, I think it's verse 2. Uh, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Whom he knew. Same word of marital sexual encounter that produces babies. And so what God is saying here in Amos, only you I have known, there's the special favored treasured possession. It's God's electing husband bride metaphor. And that's why we saw last week, what did God's select favored nation do? She became a harlot. She, under every tree, uh, uh, she committed adultery in the face of God's lordship. But remember, it was types and shadows, okay? And the main message of the old covenant is the second use of the law. I believe it's the second use. Uh, in which God uses the law to crush the sinner and show him or her his need of that, his provision, what Jesus did 
That's what the second use of the law is, and that's what the Mosaic law was primarily used for. However, all three uses of the law are used in the Mosaic law. God used the law to curb Israel's harlotry, to bring and force conformity to his statutes. And it worked in some cases with some degree. That's the first use of the law. And then the third use of the law, well, the second use of the law we talked about, it brings and reveals Israel's need. And then the third use of the law, David says, oh, how I love thy law. You see, now the law of God becomes something that I respond to because I have been regenerated and God's spirit is within me and now I'm truly the bride that God has wanted and desired and willed because he's placed his spirit in me and I'm madly in love with him and so are you. And that's God's mission that was God's mission in the garden, and that is God's mission now. You see, this is a love story. Uh, and our response becomes important. Abraham is given a conditional. All of God's people are given conditionals if you continue if you obey and now I'm going to tell you not suggest to you that those conditionals are in the new covenant as well I mean did you hear the incarnate son of God speak to you if anyone comes to me, does not hate his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even his own life, cannot be my disciple. If he does, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. What's a cross? Oh, it's just kind of doing good when you don't feel like it. The cross is death. And it's repeated again in verse 33. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all all that he has cannot be my disciple. Man, those are some pretty heavy conditions that Jesus just laid on us. I mean, I thought this whole thing of Christianity is that Christianity is unique among all the religions because it's a religion of grace. And grace has been so watered down, Bonhoeffer called it cheap grace. In political terms, we call it freebies. I get a free education. I, I get free insurance. I, I get free this and free that. And that's what the church has done with grace. Bonhoeffer called it cheap grace. He put his finger on the problem of the American church. It's all about the spirit in America of, of just, uh, uh, you know, everything is going to work out for me. Everything has to work out for me. Everything is for my good. God has a wonderful plan for my life. And yet Jesus lays some pretty heavy conditionals. So heavy, I would suggest to you that even as I kind of weigh my spirituality, I, I can't stand up against these verses. If you think you can stand up before these verses, I will tell you, you are deceived. This isn't about, oh, I found something in my grocery bag at Walmart that doesn't show up on my list, and I'm going to go back, and here it is, the toothbrush somehow didn't get checked. That's a kind of civil righteousness, and I'm glad you do that, and I hope I do that when that comes my turn, but there's a fundamental problem with human nature, and it's the inability and the spirit of cosmic treason that we have before God's holy presence. And Jesus is saying, unless you die, unless you give up everything, wife, mother, children, husbands, yea, your own life, you can't be my disciple. How does that happen? 
Are all the conditions of Abraham, he did it, and and I hope I can be like Abraham? Oh, well, maybe David, the king, he did it. I hope I can be like David. You know, but I, I fall short sometimes. That's such a wrong view of human nature, fallen human nature. There's a cosmic treason seed in the human heart. We're all bad trees. Coram Deo, before God. And Jesus said, only good trees can yield good fruit and only bad trees can yield bad fruit. What is Jesus getting at? The absolute necessity of regeneration for you to render anything of good before Coram Deo, before God's presence. Go to the second to the last chapter of your bulletin. Let's read together chapter 16 of the Westminster Confession of Faith, the segment on good works. This will help you understand what I'm talking about. The whole cosmic treason thing, the whole call for you to die to yourself, to die to everything, including yourself. Chapter 16, good works. Works done by people who have not been spiritually reborn, that's regeneration, may be the same as those commanded by God and may be of good use to them and to others. You see, all these non-Christians out there, they think themselves pretty good. And if they know you, they probably savor seeing your fractures and some of your failings, and they go, you know what? I'm as good as Carl. You know, I know I have that cream thing, and I don't, I don't, I don't have that, but, but I'm a pretty good person. They may do the same works that you do. They may do better and more works than you do, and they're profitable to others. 23, however, since they do not proceed from a heart purified by faith. Read into that Jesus' just uh, parable of a good tree. Since they are not a good tree, those works that are the same of your, as yours are not done in the right way. And what's the right way? I.e., in response to God's Word. They're not done for the right purpose, the glory of God. His mission, the works of civilly righteous people that may exceed yours, are not done with the motive of God's mission. They're not done for His glory. They're not done with the recognition that, albeit for the grace of God, I'm a cosmic person who's committed treason and I'm doomed. I have nothing in me that gravitates toward God quorum Deo. They are therefore sinful and cannot please God. You see how God hides even as He reveals? I don't know if you've ever felt that there's more goodness in some non-Christians than yourself. I mean, I think the church needs to bear fruit, and so therefore that should be a hard challenge. But nonetheless, I've met plenty of good people whom I don't think are Christians who have done better and more works than I. They cannot please God or make a person fit to receive grace from God. Nevertheless, it is more sinful and displeasing to God not to do such works than to do them. So even these unrighteous deeds of civil righteousness, there's going to be a greater punishment for them if they don't do those works which cannot be pleasing to God because they're not done with the mission of God in mind and with the right motivation of being a good tree. If they fail to do those civil righteous deeds, they're going to be exposed to a greater judgment. See, God is just. If you want justice, then run from Christ, reject Christ, and you will get justice. But I'm here to tell you that's going to be a damnable result, and that's not good. There's scripture support for those. You can take that home and begin to understand what true righteousness is. And I pray as a church that we will be responsive to God's conditionals 
God's conditionals are not meritorious in the strict sense. When God told Abraham, if you remain obedient, if you do this, when he told uh, all of God's children in the Old Covenant and in the New, Paul will say, I keep, I, 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 uh, I discipline my body, I beat it into subjection. Why? Lest I become a castaway and therefore not answer the commands of God. But keep in mind, those conditions of which the church is called to fulfill are not meritorious. They are a deep reflection of being who you is. That's why it's so hard in marital counseling when people are going in the wrong direction to say to somebody, well, do it even if you don't feel like it. Oh, this is not genuine. Nope, it's not. But feelings come and follow behavior much of the time. I know the end goal. The end goal of all of us is to fall in love again. The end goal is to cast that will in which you are easily giving yourself time, talent, and treasure to this other person in your life whom God gave you and whom you committed yourself to. The end goal is to make that a beautiful thing. God is painting through your marriage something glorious for people to see now and in eternity it's going to be glorious absolutely. And so the conditionals that God has given us are there merely to reflect who we is. And I'm saying that intentionally. I, I know I'm just a country boy, but I know language a little bit. That I'm making a point here. A good tree cannot but yield abundant and good fruit. And you are a good tree because God has chosen you as his bride. Bask in it, live faithfully in it, and you will be blessed, and ultimately so in every way, shape, and form, when this age of two ages ceases and all that is left is divine glory in heaven. May that be your lot and mine in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I put away my bulletin. That's a mistake. Okay. Um, let's, uh, let's go right to the... Let's say the Lord's Prayer in unison. Let's stand, and then let's sing the doxology right after that. Changing things up a bit here. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
that have come from God's regenerative work in your life. That's why God can command them. He can threaten you if they're not present, but they will be present because of what He has done in you. His love is created love in you. That's the husband's initiating role. That's what He has done with the bride. He has created those love strands by His Spirit in you. And this is the covenant renewal. Non-meritorious revisitation of God's covenant in Christ with you, His bride. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. Covenant renewal, brothers and sisters in Christ. He brought his disciples here before he ascended to rule and reign through his spirit. And he took the bread and he said, this is my body given for you, take and eat. In the same way, he took the cup of blessing within that Passover meal. And when he had given thanks, he poured the fruit of the vine. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you for the remission of sins. This drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. The body and blood of Christ given and shed for you. I had that out of sync. And in this covenant meal, we understand something of God, the Lord sovereign, the absolute ruler of all that is, the one who does all things according to the good pleasure of his will. Here is our covenant renewal, and what is it? He comes and he gives himself to you. That's what this absolute sovereign God does. He gives himself to you. And when Jesus washed the hands and the feet of his disciples, what he said, what I have done to you, the servant is not above his master, now you go and do to others. This is the radical truth of Christianity, brothers and sisters. Yes, our distinction is the absolute sovereign rule of God, the Reformed tradition, but what we fail to emphasize is that the mark of this God is that he gives himself to death 
for a lost and dying world to accomplish his mission of a people and a place with his presence. This is your love feast. That's what they called this in the New Testament. Come, receive from your lover his promises in faith. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I'm not going to sing. I'm going to give you the benediction. I'm going to take you back to Amos chapter 3, verse 2. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. What love message follows that? Write it out. Here's a piece of paper. Write out what God says after that. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Even in a more succinct than God's people in God's place with God's presence is this. Salvation through judgment. This deep, mysterious thing called sin. This deep, mysterious thing of cosmic treason. It's all encapsulated, encapsulated in God's will in which he does all things according to his good pleasure. Wrath was brought upon this world to show you how deep his love is. He gave himself to death for you. And that's why when he says, I'm going to punish your sins in shadowy form, it has its end goal. That's the type the anti-type or the reality is he did punish your sins. But it reflects his heart. He punished himself. He gave himself for you. So, brothers and sisters, go in the treasured possessional status of being the only one whom God loves. Each individual, because God is infinite. He takes you into his arms. He gives you himself. In, in every shape, way, or in form. Enjoy him, listen to him, be faithful to him, and enjoy him. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you for coming.